going to spend the whole day with the Blessed Mother. Now I don't want to interfere with uh, your seminary chapel, but I don't know, looking at the Blessed Mother there, such a beautiful picture, it is true that she is a humble person, but I would suggest if Father Virio allows me th to, to say that maybe that image should be up there, next to the crucifix. Eh? Because that's where the place of the, the Blessed Mother. The Blessed Mother is always next to the crucifix. So maybe someone has a nail or something. That would be nice up there. <coughs> okay. Today the topic is Mary, the mother, and the model of the priest, especially the Scalabrinian. Mother. Mother because she gives birth to Jesus in us. Who is going to bring uh, Jesus to birth in our hearts? It's the Blessed Mother. Because she is the mother. And she will always remain as the mother. Also model because uh, a model, you imitate a model. You try to look up to a model. And so Mary is also to be imitated and looked up as a model. Let me start with a little uh, uh, sentence which could be a little surprising. If you don't fall in love with Mary, you're gonna fall in love with another woman. Let me repeat. If you don't fall in love with Mary, in your life, you're gonna fall in love with another woman. Why? Because we are humans. So we need tenderness. We need beauty. You know, uh, Pope Benedict XVI spoke a lot about the attraction of beauty. Beauty really catches your attention, catches your heart. And as human beings, we live these experiences of tenderness. We all remember our mothers, how tender they were toward us. And then during life, we always admire, for instance, a young lady with such a tenderness. It is something that, humanly speaking, it attracts you. It calls you, because we have been created like that. The maternal aspect of a woman is something that we as a priest need. You know why? Because many times there are going to be people, children, adults, who come to you because they need that maternal affection. Because they don't find it anyplace else. And through you, then they can find the maternal affection of Mary, of Jesus. You know, sometimes you see certain priests, they are afraid to touch a human being. Look at the Pope, how he embraces children, adults, sick, sinners. He embraced them. That's because he is human. And that's because, you know, he is uh, close to Christ. The mystical aspect of our spiritual life is much more evident in the women than in men. You know, in men, we want to do things. We are tough. Women, they have more like an instinct toward deep mystical prayer. If you look around, look at big saints. They always have a woman, next saint next to them. Francis and Claire, Saint Benedict, Scholastica. There was um, even Saint Jerome in the beginning of the Saint Jerome used to have a Roman uh, noble woman who then followed him in uh, Bethlehem. And it seems that the man, the saint man needs a saint woman in order to really grow to the deepest sense of it. But remember that there is nothing sentimental about. 
We'll see later on when we talk about Joseph. The love of Joseph for Mary. He was crazy for Mary. But at a level that was mystical, was uh, sovereabundant, that the spiritual love <coughs> can overshadow the human love. The spiritual love is so full, so great, that you don't need anything else. You don't need the human love because it is already involved, contained into the spiritual love. So the final uh, aspect of Mary is uh, oblative. Oblation means to give totally yourself to a goal, to God, but constantly. It's not one, okay, I gave you $10, that's it, no more. No, oblation means that you are constantly giving. It's like a fountain that you give to, uh, to others. So let us start the life of Mary, the Annunciation. <clears throat> the Annunciation for Mary was something scary. You know, our painters, they paint all oh, beautiful images, the angels, uh, blonde hair. It was nothing like that. Because the angel says immediately, do not be afraid, Mary. The first word that the angel says, do not be afraid. Because it was something awesome, they say, but scary. The poor lady, all of, all of a sudden, this girl was 14 years old. She sees a man next to her. Naturally, she was scared. And also, it was something totally strange. She never had that experience before. Nobody else had that experience before. So she was really taken by surprise and by fear. That's why the angels calmed her down and said, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And then when the angel says, you're going to have a baby, imagine this young lady. She was already consecrated to God, you remember, from the temple. She was all set in her ways to live the rest of her life in prayer and for God. All of a sudden, this young man says, you're going to have a baby. Wait a minute. I don't know any man. Says, if I accept to have a baby, I risk my life. Remember that, according to the law of Moses, the women were pregnant before marriage. They were, had to be stoned to death like they do today in Arabia. So when she says, wait a minute, if I have a, I'm going to have a baby, I'm going to be stoned to death. Secondly, what are my parents going to think? Thirdly, and my boyfriend, Joseph, he's going to leave me. What am I going to say to Joseph? That an angel appeared me and now I'm pregnant? Who's going to believe that? So you see that for Mary, that Annunciation has almost been a traumatic experience. As a matter of fact, she asked, how can this happen? She's asking questions because nothing was clear. Then all of a sudden, faith comes in. Then she remembers that the promise of God for thousands of years the promise of God is that one day the Savior would come. And she was a good girl. She studied in the temple. She knew the Bible. So she knew all these promises of the Old Testament. And immediately it sparked in her mind, wow, this is the moment, the fulfillment of the promise for my people. And so in that moment she put herself completely to the, the mercy of the grace of God. He says, let it be done to me according to your word. Even here it says, hey, wait a minute. Now I have to prepare the cradle. Now I have to start preparing the little uh, dr the dress for this baby. Maybe, I don't know, I need another house. Maybe I have to move out of my parents' house. 
She didn't say, didn't think anything of that. She says, let it be done to me. In the TV, she doesn't worry about anything. Let it be done to me. The humility of saying, okay, I'm here. I am the servant of the Lord. And, uh, you know, she, she accepts. She accepts in total trust. She risks her life. Because according to the law of Moses, she was supposed to be stoned to death. So you see that annunciation is a total abandonment in the hands of God. Happened what happened to me, I am here. Let it be done to me. Now let's look at Joseph. So Joseph, all of a sudden, says, wait a minute, you are pregnant. But we don't live together. How can this happen? But the Bible says something very interesting. He was a just man. A holy man. Why? They say that even Mo uh, Joseph was already consecrated to God. He had already made that promise. And that uh, uh, say, uh, gift to God. That he was going to spend his life for God. Like us. So Joseph is confused. He says, wait a minute, what's happening here? Both of us are consecrated to God. Both of us want to spend our life, and now there is a baby coming. But he is a holy man. Remember that. He does not doubt Mary. Never. Joseph thought, oh, maybe she went with another man. Never passed this in the mind of Joseph. Because he knew her too well. And he knew that whatever was happening was not something wrong. But it was something beautiful. Something great. But he feels that it is too much for him. Wow, he says, I don't know how to handle this. What can I do? How do I treat this? And so because he was a just man and loving man. He loved Mary. And he knew that it was impossible that she would have done something wrong. So the only solution is, okay, I bring you back to your mother. Stay there with your mother. I, I don't want to, to get involved in this. And that was the, the easiest. You know why? Because if Joseph would have said something to the rabbi, the rabbi would have called Mary to be stoned. If Joseph would have said, look, She's pregnant, but it's not mine, the baby. Because they already married, legally married. Mary would have been stoned to death. So that's why Joseph, and the gospel says very clearly, he didn't want to uh, expose her, you know, to the criticism of the town. So Joseph says, okay, let's secretly stay home, go to your mother and stay there. The angel comes to him and says, no, 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 no. You have... You must take Mary. And now he says, wow, I have to take Mary. Yes, it's because you are going to give the name to Jesus, son of David. See, Joseph was from the tribe of David. So he was the only one who could really give the name, the legal name to Jesus, son of David. And that was all the promises in the Old Testament. Everything to David, you, your, your king is going to... Uh, be forever uh, you, your uh, generations will never end so now Joseph understands that he is part of the project of God he cannot just escape or stay outside, no no you have to become involved, you are going to be uh, a central part of this mystery of this plan of salvation because you are going to give the name to Jesus, imagine if Jesus would not have a father. Nobody would believe him. He would not, not have any right in, in town. He would not even speak in public. Because you are nobody. That's why Joseph is important. He gives the status. Social and legal status to Jesus. And then at the same time he fulfills all the promises. Because the Savior was supposed to be a son of David. So now Joseph, imagine, once he understands 
this plan of God, ah, he falls madly in love with Mary, who is carrying Jesus. And you can imagine the joy of Joseph jumping for joy because, wow, the, the promise for 2,000 years, the promise now is going to be fulfilled and I am in charge of this. You can imagine how he felt, Joseph, and how much he was in love with Mary. And at the same time, how much the love of Mary for Joseph. You can imagine she went through this traumatic experience. Now she's going to have a baby. And this man, instead of being jealous, he's fully, totally in love with her. And he does whatever he can. Because now he understands the plan of God. Like Mary now does. So the two of them are so united in that mystery that they are madly in love for each other. So you see that from then on, we see Joseph taking care of uh, the birth. They go down to Bethlehem. Then they go to Egypt. Then they go back to Na Nazareth. So Joseph is really taking care of Mary and Jesus. Then the birth in Bethlehem. You know, uh, it, it was uh, something difficult. Imagine, it takes a week to walk from Nazareth to Jerusalem. And Bethlehem was uh, close by there. Now this poor uh, girl, 14 years old girl, she's pregnant for the first time, so she, she's even worried about. And she has to take this long trip down to uh, Bethlehem. She has, uh, Joseph has to think about eating. They, it was dangerous to uh, walk through the desert. But most of the times they used to go in caravans. They used to go in groups just to protect each other. But still, Mary has to do a great sacrifice to move from, um, from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem. And she goes. Even before that, after the Annunciation, the angel says, your cousin Elizabeth is going to have a baby. She doesn't say, oh, but now I'm pregnant. Oh, but now it's too much. I don't have a donkey. I don't know if Joseph wants to come. She doesn't find excuses. She just runs down to Ankarim, where her uh, cousin Elizabeth is having a baby so late. And there, it says, you see two women full of joy. Actually, even the two babies in their wombs uh, leapt for joy. And Mary doesn't think about herself, but thinks about her cousin. How to help her cousin. And when they meet each other, Mary comes out with a beautiful song of Magnificat. I forgot to bring it, but anyway. The Magnificat is the equivalent of the Beatitudes of Jesus. Mary has her own hymn of praise, her own Beatitudes, which are also promises. Eh? Because it says, first of all, it says, I magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I'm happy. I'm happy because finally the plan of God begins to be fulfilled. Then it says, the Lord it says, is going to lower the proud and uh, help the poor. Uh, the, the mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. Every generation. Not just the people of Israel. Uh, he has scattered the proud. He has, con uh, he has uh, lifted, uh, no, uh, lowered the mighty and lifted the poor. So you see that many of those words are used also by Jesus in the Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. Blessed those who uh, suffer and those who mourn. Blessed uh, those who are persecuted for justice sake. So you see that the Magnifica, the Beatitudes, they have a lot of resemblance. Because this is the song of Mary and that was the plan of action of Jesus. So you see that uh, it is beautiful to see how Mary is already 
so much into the plan of God. Okay, then the whole story of the birth of Jesus. You know, first of all, they are rejected. I wonder, because you know that Joseph had some uh, friends and relatives in Bethlehem, because he was there, his house was there. And I was surprised to find out no one had a little room for this cousin of theirs that came down from Nazareth. Even the relatives and friends rejected Mary and Joseph. Maybe because she was very pregnant <laughs> and uh, they didn't want to get involved in all that. Still, you know, the rejection. Mary and Joseph, these two young people uh, with such a great mystery in their hands and nobody else helps. Nobody's helping. That was, uh, I think, a very, very tough situation. They are in a town that not well known because they were coming from Nazareth. And here it says they are displaced somehow because of a stupid emperor in Rome. He wanted to know how many people and how much taxes he could uh, charge to those people. So you see that uh, they go through a very painful uh, moment when they are rejected by everybody, even their families. They have to go down because of uh, politics and uh, all kind of uh, rules and regulations. And in their hands, they are carrying that great mystery that Jesus is going to be born. Then it says, you have uh, Herod. He's already trying to kill the poor baby. As soon as he's born, he wants to get rid of it because he's afraid. He's afraid that this little baby is going to overthrow him. He's going to take over his kingdom. And so they flee to Egypt. Imagine these are the image of the, of the you know, holy, the flight in, into Egypt. This is our, our symbol, our image. Imagine Joseph. He has to learn another language. And you know how difficult it is to learn another language. He has to find a job. How is he going to buy the food? You know, he has to find a house, a place. So uh, Joseph had to, to go through a lot. You know, because now we say, oh, a beautiful flight into Egypt. But flying into Egypt was a, a terrible uh, experience they had to go through. And then finally, they have to come back. Because now Herod is dead, and they can go back to Nazareth. So from Egypt down to Jerusalem, and then to Nazareth. And there they remain 30 years in silence. I don't know how many times Mary told Jesus, but Jesus, when are you going to start this blessed uh, new kingdom? Sometimes I don't think Mary, but uh, Our Lady says, when are you going to get married? Uh, says, Probably. But, you know, more than that, Mary and uh, Joseph and Jesus, probably they were reading the, the scriptures, all the promises, all the prophets. And they were understanding, they were seeing that all those promises were referring to them. So then finally, uh, Jesus leaves home. There is a beautiful um, saint who describes the scene when Jesus says goodbye to his mother. And the mother knew that uh, that was the moment when he had to leave, go down to Jerusalem to be sacrificed. It was not just uh, saying goodbye. It was that they knew that the moment of the, uh, the sacrificial offering was coming. The first miracle he does is at the Cana in Galilee, at the wedding. Uh, so you see the importance of a wedding. Jesus begins his ministry at a wedding feast. And there we see a little bit of, um, how do you call it, misunderstanding. Mary says, they have no wine. I said, Ma, leave me alone. Leave me out of this. It's not my time. But most of all, I think Jesus was kind of probing and trying to understand what the mother was saying. They have no wine. So you have to start doing something. And then Mary says, do whatever he tells you. Somehow I feel that Mary knew, even before Jesus, that that was the moment 
when he was supposed to start his ministry. Maybe Mary as a mother uh, knew, had that sense that the moment was ripe. The moment had come. And as Mary gave birth to Jesus, now she gives birth to the ministry of Jesus. Her, his mission. And says, go, do whatever he tells you. And there he makes the first miracle. And the gospel says very clearly that from that moment, the disciples began to believe in him. And that's a real beginning of his public life. So, now Jesus is out there and we don't see much of Mary. But I believe that Mary was following Jesus. As a matter of fact, one day they told Jesus, look out there, there is your mother, your brothers, they want to talk to you. And then when Jesus says, who is my mother, my brother, my sister. Eh? So uh, I believe that Mary, from the background, Mary was really following Jesus. And uh, you see at the cross, she was there. And uh, then at the Pentecost, she's there. I think she was already used to take care of the apostles. Who was going to cook? Who's going to uh, wash the, you know, the, the clothes? I think Mary and the Gospel talks about a group of women. They were there to assist Jesus, even in the public life. And uh, so that Mary was always, always next to Jesus. I'm going to kind of uh, close with a question. Where was Mary in the morning of the resurrection? Where was she? The gospel doesn't say anything. There are the three Marys goes down to the tomb, but she was not there. The mother of Jesus was not there. How come? Imagine if a mother has a chance to see for the last time the body of Jesus, the body of her son. Imagine that a mother doesn't run to go and see for the last time the body of her son. But she knew, she knew that the body of Jesus was not there. That's why in faith, she was sure that Jesus was alive. I, uh, I really liked a, a, a personal comment of John Paul II. One year he said, let me think, it's not written, says, but let me think that Jesus, that Sunday morning of the resurrection, first of all he went to see his mother. And then he showed himself to the disciples. And I like to think, think that too. I'm sure that Jesus, first of all, went to see his mother the only one who believed in him. When he was dying on the cross and everybody uh, ran away, she was the only one who believed, no, something must happen. Cannot be true that he's dead. Cannot be remain under the power of death. She knew that she had the Annunciation in the beginning. She knew that he was the son of God. So you see that Mary did not need to go down to see the empty tomb. She knew. She had the certainty in her faith, in her heart, that Jesus was alive. And that's why she's not there. And I repeat, I love that uh, suggestion of John Paul II, who says, I'm sure that Jesus went first of all to see her, his mother. Ma, I'm here. I'm back. Like you believed me, now you see, I'm here. So you see that Mary, Mary. And then... Mary is the one who is able to gather all the apostles. No, everybody's run away. Who is the one kind of gathering back all the disciples? That's Mary. Because they knew her for sure. And because I believe she was doing that even before when Jesus was alive. That's why she's able to gather all the disciples back and receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let me conclude uh, saying this. Uh, if you do not have a deep devotion to Mary, 
you cannot be a Scalabrinian priest. Because the Bishop Scalabrini was madly in love with the Blessed Mother. And he uh, built and restored many shrines to the Blessed Mother. And we'll see in this afternoon that uh, Mary is also a copy, a reproduction of our own vocation, annunciation. Our vocation, vocation call is an annunciation. Right? Rejection, how many times we have difficulties of following our vocation. Then we have, we have to move away. You come from Vietnam, from Indonesia, from uh, whoever, Brazil. And you too have to move away. And then all the consecration, the vows that Mary took. The life of Mary is exactly the life of the priest. It's like a copy. So that's why I say Mary is a great part. Actually, it is a necessary part in our life as a priest. Let me conclude that um, with a little example. I had the opportunity to, to work a lot for Mary in my life. And I am almost privileged and happy that I was given the, the possibility of doing something for Mary when I was... Uh, uh, many, about 20, how long, 23 years ago, my father died, and I go home, and I see my mother next to a radio with uh, rosary beans. I say, Ma, what are you doing? Ah, you know, there is a beautiful rosary in this radio, and I pray with them. Ah, one day, two days, and I see my mother there all at 5 o'clock, 5.45. She goes there with the rosary beads and prays. At that time, I was working in New York in an office for Italian immigrants. And I started listening to the radio. I said, wow, this is good. Good stuff. And immediately came to my mind, what a beautiful thing if we could bring this radio from Italy into the Italians in New York. And so when I came back, I started talking a little bit. Then two or three people got together and said, yeah, OK, let's try to make something. A few months later, I called uh, the people in Italy, says, you know, we would like to have your radio here in New York. And he says, okay, he says, uh, give us a few months and we'll be there. Imagine, uh, when we started by ourselves, I was paying $1,000 a month for, to have a little uh, uh, radio. They come and they had all their uh, uh, papers done and they start $10,000 a month. Oh my God, I says, who is going to find that money? Who is going to uh, ask, you know, we are just starting. And then I was thinking in my mind, if my superiors know about this, they're going to say that I'm crazy. How can I get involved in such a big project? So I remember I didn't sleep for two or three nights. I says, my goodness, how am I going to tell the superior now? And they said, don't worry, we'll do it, don't worry. Yeah, don't worry, but then once you go back to Italy, <laughs> it's up to me. Yeah. He says, I'm staying here, you know, you go and I'm staying. But then I felt almost like a, a peace of mind. You know, I was afraid, but deep down it says, no, this is a good thing, it has to go on. And uh, actually, they started. We started. And for many years in the beginning, they supported me, so uh, the radio was able to go on. And then we got some volunteers, some people. But I tell you, and Father Mariano can tell you because he succeeded me, uh, you know how much good that radio did, is Radio Maria. Uh, and it did so much good, even today. Today I find pl people, especially the elderly, all over the place, oh, Father Walter, thank you, thank you for Radio Maria. And uh, thousands and thousands of people pray together every night with the radio, like my mother, you know. And uh, with that radio, I was almost obliged to be in touch with the Blessed Mother. I think she got me and says, you know, now you are going to do this job. And uh, I thank the Lord and the Blessed Mother because that gave me a chance to be close to the Blessed Mother close uh, preaching, uh, talking, uh, praying together with people, always together with the Blessed Mother. And I can only thank the Lord, the Blessed Mother, 
for this opportunity to be at her direct service, doing things for her. And that gave my life, my priesthood, a lot of joy, a lot of satisfaction. And when sometimes I went off the road, she brought me back. He says, now you stay here, be a good boy. And then uh, I says, I, I was able to live, to live a beautiful life as a priest and as a Scalabrinian. So I say, the Blessed Mother, and you know that the immigrants have such a great faith on the Blessed Mother all uh, kind of immigrants they are so attached to the blessed mother and we as their shepherds we have to be even more attached attached uh, to them and it's strange that uh, i was in montreal our lady of pompeii now i'm in new york our lady of pompeii and before saint joseph so i have the, the two of them together in my life you know as a priest so I repeat again, if you don't fall in love with the Blessed Mother, you're going to fall in love with another woman. Okay.